New York and on the new Hot 97 app. Ebro in the morning. On Hot 97. It is the one and only Hot 97 breaking news. Breaking news. Mayor de Blasio has stepped in the room on New York City's own, Tri-State's own, Hot 97. Give it up for Mayor de Blasio, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Mayor Bill. This is the place to be. Um, uh, wait, wait, wait. I have to welcome him back with something, Ebro, before oh, even start. Hit him, hit him. You know that we love you. We consider you friends. No, no disclaimers. No too. disclaimers. Love. So you're family, so I, we can only give you the truth. So I have a gift for you. Yeah. Congratulations. You played yourself. <laughs> Why? Why you is ran? That? Well, because you ran, and you're back now. This yeah. anytime a friend well, strikes no, you out, ran, to no, do something that so special. I thought you were gonna do more than that. I was like, <laughs> no, no, no. Basically, what he's saying is, you is you went out to try to run for president. Yeah, it didn't work out. Yeah. Congratulations, you played yourself. Yeah, That's but what he's he saying. couldn't. He couldn't come up with something more. Interesting well, it's our than bit. That. We wow. do that every morning. Wow. It's early. We do it at wow. seven. Wow. Really, really. Well, this show used to be higher level. What's about jumping the shark and all that? I gotta tell you though, I like I like There's your some shark jumping going on. Yeah. I liked your well I liked played, your energy. Man. I liked your energy well when you walked in today though. You have like a you seem relaxed. You seem yeah. like there's a little bit of a you know Well we had a big day yesterday. And that's you know, victory is a good thing. And it was a victory for change. It was a victory for humanity. Because remember what happened yesterday, that vote to get off Rikers Island once and for all, close down Rikers Island, is really about valuing human beings. Uh, let's let's just put it in perspective. Mm. Mass incarceration was about dehumanizing people, typically young men of color. Uh, what we are doing now is something entirely different. We're putting that whole era behind us. And something truly historical happened yesterday. A bunch of people not only said, let's close Rikers Island, they said, let's treat those who happen to end up in jail at some point in their life humanely and focus on redemption and change. And there even were folks who said, I believe in that so much. If there has to be a jail, I'll take it in my own district rather than let Rikers Island continue, which well, is a pretty astounding that's a big deal. There's historical a, moment. It is being reported today that the uh, police commissioner, Jimmy O, is happy with the closing but not happy with how this is playing out with the long-term plan? Is that, am I no, understanding I, look, right? I, I don't. I don't think that's a fair characterization. His job is, by definition, to be worried about how we keep crime down. That's right. He's done an outstanding job reducing crime. We're, remember, we're at a level of crime in New York City that ha has not been seen since the 1950s. I mean, just try and imagine how far we have come. And, and crime continues to go down. So his job is to worry and keep wanting to make sure we, we you know, sustain that. But we've been talking about this as an entire administration now for several years and absolutely clear that we're going to keep crime down, keep the number of people who have to ever be incarcerated lower. Remember, we're doing all sorts of alternatives to incarceration. They're working. Uh, Albany changed the bail laws, so a whole lot of people were in Rikers just because they could not afford bail for low-level offenses. That's the famous horrible tragedy of Khalif mm -hmm. Browder. That's right. Uh, that's over now. Uh, the laws have changed. The whole thing has changed. So I I'm convinced that we can sustain this for the long term. So walk me through it. Um, Rikers closes, um, or it's been voted, so that's what we know. When does it officially Close, it closes by law now. I want everyone to understand this. This is legally binding. In 2026, when everything is built, it shuts down. No questions asked. It shuts down. Everything that is about corrections is removed. And so we'll figure out a whole different use for and it can that law be reversed? You know, you you're only in office for what two more years? Two years plus. Yeah, but it could be reversed. But let me remind you what it will take if someone wants to reverse it. Then they're buying into Rikers Island again. There is literally no other alternative. You're and either the problem, for getting off Rikers Island, or if some mayor or anyone else comes along and says, oh, I don't like the plan that was voted on before, right. then they're going right back to Rikers Island. People of this city are not going to accept that. So, and, and walk through, I mean, we obviously understand that Rikers Island, um, the inhumaneness of it, yes. but there's also the fact that there was overcrowding. Yes. There's the the time that, you know, people spend on the island without even being charged because of the bureaucracy and dealing with the et cetera, et cetera. So now you're saying, okay, we want to get away from that. We're going to put smaller community jails. facilities and they are, look, here's the, the key. And there was a whole movement that fought hard for this. I want to be really, really clear. A lot of people 
years ago said, hey, we should aspire to this. And, and I've been honest about it. For me and for a lot of other people, we, we couldn't figure out how to do it at first. We thought that was a beautiful idea, but we don't know how to do it. But then as we kept driving down crime and reducing arrests, and this is the thing, I really want your listeners to hear this one. This is, this is the pivot. In 2018, the NYPD arrested 150,000 fewer people than five years earlier. 150,000 fewer arrests, and we got safer. By all the numbers, by all the facts, we got safer. So we have all been sold a bill of goods in this country for decades that you have to arrest and arrest and arrest and punish and punish and punish. Turned out it was actually counterproductive. Turned out it was actually setting back, even destroying the lives of a lot of people. And it was inhumane. And, and a whole series of things come together to change the consciousness and change a sense of what's possible. But when we stopped arresting people and we got safer, well, if you, do, if you want to end mass incarceration, stop arresting people who don't even need to be arrested to begin with, right? right? So it's been proven now. So the reason I say that is that opened the door to a whole rethinking. Now what we're going to have is community-based jails where they're right near the courthouse. So a lot of the reason people ended up staying in a long time when they were awaiting trial was the Rikers was very, very far away from a lot of the courthouses in the boroughs. Mm -hmm. And so uh, someone who was in jail was supposed to go to a court appearance. And they couldn't get there in time. It was postponed or they had to be taken back. It was postponed and trials went on and on and on. Mm. Now you're going to have anyone awaiting trial either right next door to a courthouse or, you know, within a mile or two of a courthouse. It's going to speed up the trials and the family members who want to visit their loved one who happens to be in jail, again, many of whom are just awaiting trial in this country, innocent until proven guilty. Right. Um, having the loved one's visit is part of the process of getting people right and getting them on the right track. And a really big thing that came out of this plan, too, I really want to say this. This is something that I hope the whole country will follow. Everyone who goes through our correction system now is part of the plan that was voted yesterday. Everyone who goes through our correction system, when they come out, they will get a transitional job guaranteed mm. so that we are saying to people, you are a human being. We value you. We know you can get right. We're not going to ask you to come out of jail and just good luck working it out because we know for a lot of people, unfortunately, that led them back in the wrong direction. We're saying come out. We will give you a job to help you get right mm. so you can then find whatever you're going to do long term. That's now going to be everyone. So I think you're going to see a lot less uh, recidivism. You're going to see a lot of people if, God forbid, they ever get involved in the justice system, it's going to be one time only. You're going to see a much greater focus on redemption and helping people move forward. And you can't do that without these community-based facilities. How many um, how many beds are on Rikers? I think, wasn't the number like 3,000? Yeah, something like no, that. Listen, let's put this in perspective. Because so I want to get into the number, the detail, you know, yeah, that whole thing. About 20 years ago in this city, mm -hmm. when you take Rikers and the other jails, it was over 20,000 people on any given day were incarcerated. 20, over 20,000. In Rikers? No, no all, all the jail system. Rikers like, the biggest whoa. piece, but there were others as well. We're down now around 7,000 in our entire jail system. By the plan we announced yesterday, we will get down to 3,300 on any given day. Now, again, this is in a city of 8.6 million people. And that 3,300 will be divvied up in between the four, four jails. locations. Yes. So people who are mad about these four locations are arguing basically over 1,000 Less people, than a thousand. Less than a one. thousand Correct. people being in each one. Correct. And you're saying that the locations are already next to the courthouse. Correct. The three of them next to, and the fourth one is short drive. And so, what's the problem in the neighborhoods that people are expressing? Because they were people were trying to be very upset yesterday. Look, I understand anyone. I understand anyone who's cynical about the government. That's right. Right? I, I talk to my constituents I have for years. I understand why people don't trust a lot of times in the first instance. I understand anyone who hears jail and they worry about their safety of their family. But the fact is, and I'll speak as a Brooklynite, you go to downtown Brooklyn, there's a jail right there. You could go by it and not even know it's there. I mean, literally not even know it's there. Right next to it are some of the most expensive brownstones in Brooklyn, you know, a couple blocks away. Right across the street here is one of, right. there's a federal facility where they had like 9-11 ter uh, uh, terrorists were right across the street from here. So there's a stereotype, and I don't, again, don't blame anyone who's worried, but the fact is just look at what's happening, truth. These facilities end up being secure, and the neighborhood keeps going around them. 
but the difference in terms of what we're all here to achieve. What does everyone want? They want no young people to end up involved in crime, or again, God forbid they do, to never go back to it. Which is why another really important piece of this, by the way, is we're funding the cure violence movement, the crisis management system, on a higher and higher level all the time. These are folks at the community level, some of whom were formerly incarcerated, who now are going and stopping violence before it happens and intervening. They're doing outstanding work. It used to be the city of New York and the police department treated that movement like something unproven or unclear, or, you know, not, not clear how we should work with them, whether we should work with them. Today, this administration, I can say we embrace it. The city council embraces it too. This movement's working. These are really powerful, noble people at the community level who are putting themselves forward to stop violence and are credible to community members, credible to young people. And we're now in this plan funding them on a much bigger level. And so this is about changing the whole idea that if we're going to stop someone from ending up involved in the criminal justice system, we have to do it in a whole different way than we did in the past. And then if they do get involved, the goal <coughs> is never come back. These facilities are going to allow us to do it. So when you think about it, if you're someone and you're in the neighborhood and you're like, oh, I'm worried about crime, I'm worried about you know, what happened to my family, my home, they, they should want a world in which fewer and fewer and fewer people ever get involved in crime, ever get involved in the criminal justice system. And this is what we are building now. Over the years that you, sorry, Laura, I just wanted to ask um, to re, for you to reemphasize, over the years of you being mayor, how much money have you diverted to make sure that these organizations that are on the ground, because I do hear a lot of them that you have, I mean, even with the Peace Mobile and us going around yeah. and uh, with Erica Ford, you know, she acknowledged yep. that your administration helped get those trauma, those mobile trauma yep. units <clears throat> put into each borough. So um, there has been a reemphasis on getting involved in those community organizations financially from the city. If you're going to save lives, if you're going to change lives, it has to happen at the grassroots. It has to be done by people who can be heard by their fellow community members. And that's what's happening with the Cure Violence movement. And so we've been putting tens of millions into it, and it's been a very powerful uh, investment. I got to say, and I want to give the NYPD a lot of credit, the, the NYPD is constantly evolving, and it's evolving in strategies, and to the credit of all the men and women in NYPD, crime keeps going down. But I have seen a lot of folks, uh, precinct commanders and uh, officers involved in our neighborhood policing initiative who now have a whole different kind of respect and communication with the cure violence movement because they understand it's part of the solution and they have opened you know their minds to what this could mean and everything is getting more and more community-based that's what people have to understand the previous approach for decades was this crazy uh, just it was almost like a, an approach to crime that did not take the human factor into account and just send in officers into communities they had no connection to right. and a very punitive, aggressive approach, and it totally backfired. But now the deeper we go into neighborhood policing, the deeper we go into cure violence, we're finding is this is what actually stops crime. And then imagine if you're a young person and you never get near that criminal reality or you never get near a gang, your whole life is different because we gave you a chance to live a very positive life. And this is just going to keep growing year after year. So we're at the beginning of something very big. So some of the concerns that I've heard uh, when it comes to the closing of Rikers, like obviously it's because of the inhumane treatment of uh, prisoners, but what? how are we tackling the, um, the correctional officers mm -hmm. that have been in Rikers for 20, 30 years working there and have been dealing with these conditions and are part of the problem? Are we just going to take them and moving in, into these new facilities? Now, we look, have the same problem? It's an important question, but I want to first say about our correction officers, it's a really tough job. And it's a job where they rightfully, and I've had this conversation with a number of correction officers, they have to worry about their safety and well-being too. You know, they want facilities that can be safe for everyone. A lot of them work hard to figure out how to build a relationship that will work to help turn around the lives of the folks who happen to be in jail. So I don't think there should be a stereotype. We are, yeah, like every other profession, there's been some bad apples too. Right, right. But um, here's what I think about the new facilities. And this is based on research from around the world. This is about creating humane, safe, redemption-oriented facilities, a whole different approach. The way they're designed, it's not about, you know, 
throwing, you know, locking someone up, throwing away the key. It's, a, it's about how you bring someone back and get them on the right track. And that the, the officers have also suffered from the bad facilities. So a bad culture developed, unquestionably. But remember, this place has been there for 85 years. Rikers was not built with any of the ideas in mind we're talking about here. It was built for an entirely different and unfortunately negative purpose. And a lot of people suffer because of that. So we're building an entirely different type of facility. It will keep the officers safer. It will keep the folks who are incarcerated safer as well. And look, the culture has to change. But this is part of why I'm so adamant about we had to get off Rikers. And I, it took me, again, years to believe there was actually a practical way to do it. But once we got there, here's the beauty of it. Let's get rid of all of that history, the physical and the approach and everything. And we've been retraining these officers constantly to parallel the approaches the NYPD is taking with neighborhood policing. So a very different approach to how you work with the people that you are charged with protecting. It's not going to happen overnight, but retraining and new facilities is going to add, I think, add up to something very different. Um, now, <clears throat> Officer Pantaleo, right? Um, we had a uh, heated exchange when you were here. An honest exchange. It was very honest. Yeah, I think it was heated. I think it was uh, honest. It was honest. I think it was honest. Um, and I think that, you know, things played out the way most of us hoped it would with him losing his job. Um, Officer Pantaleo, uh, with regard to the killing of Eric Garner. After that, the NY, some officers with the NYPD were vocal about a kind of a hands-off approach and, yeah, but, but you know, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to stop you right there. Just respectfully, not some officers, some police union leaders. Okay. I want to be fair because this is like a constant in decades and decades and decades of New York City history. Certain police union leaders set a certain tone. Okay. I think often it's been a very unfortunate tone. But meanwhile, men and women of the force kept doing their job. So there was people in those chat rooms who claimed to be officers chiming in on that it was getting shared on Facebook of them. I shouldn't assume that those are officers? First of all, a lot of that comes from retired officers. We know this. Okay who were brought up in a very different system and have very different assumptions, and there's a lot of generational change happening. I went, I went to the swearing-in of the newest NYPD class. 60% New York City residents, it's about 34% Latino, something like 18% African American, 15% or so Asian, 27% women. The NYPD is changing organically in its composition, the NYPD is changing in terms of generational attitudes. The generation coming up, I think, is the most you know, open-minded, inclusive generation we've ever seen. And not just in the NYPD, in yeah. our whole culture, yeah, right? That's facts. And the neighborhood policing philosophy and the training and the de-escalation training, it's a whole different world. I think, I think people often, I don't blame anyone, but we're all kind of stuck in time. Like some mm -hmm. people have a stereotype. A lot of the media, with all due respect to them, write about New York City like we're still in the 70s and 80s. Um, and I think a lot of us, all of us sort of have some point in history where we're a little too tied to. But if you look at what's happening right now, it's a very, very different NYPD. So in, when you talk about that, certain union leaders say outrageous and divisive things. Why do they do that? Can you take, take I, I think they're playing to the cheap seats. I think they're playing to the right wing element in their own union. And they think it's good politics. And it's so that, not yeah, that's good for the city. So what is the good politics for them? What are they hoping that's to gain? how they think they get elected. It's how they keep their job. I mean, it's no different than, you know, the president has his sense of his base and he's just going to keep playing to his base. And when they raise right money, those people are the people who give them money and raise funds for their unions or whatever. Right. So keep it's, them it's just politics. It's not. And it's very sad politics because it's what we should all be talking about is what's right for our communities, what's right for our officers and their safety. How do we bring everyone together, which is what, to the credit of Jimmy O'Neill and the leadership of NYPD, they've been doing. And you can tell that the vast majority of officers get it. We've surveyed them quite a bit. We know that they understand neighborhood policing and understand it's more rewarding. Who would want to be the cop who's stopping and frisking people all the time? Cops didn't like that. They didn't like quotas. We got rid of all that. Cops now having the reality of having much deeper relationships with community members, much more appreciation from community. And being rewarded for having that. Of course. That's the other part. Absolutely. And we want that. We want our officers to feel uh, that they're respected as professionals. We want them to feel it's gratifying work. And I think it was what's happening more and more. But even when all these accusations were going on about what the cops were thinking, what crime kept going down. In the month of August, when all this happened, 
Crime went down and gun seizures went up right in the middle of all that. So I'm ha- I have a lot of respect for our everyday NYPD officers who I think don't pay attention to the noise and the politics, but are professionals there to do a job, and they kept doing their job. And I, and I also, you know, Jimmy O and you yourself also ignored a lot of that noise and kept going about the plan, which I think we all salute up here. Was it, uh, was it frustrating to feel uh, negative energy towards you over the Pantaleo thing, even during the debate, the, you had those protesters screaming out, fire Pantaleo. When you came on our show, you seemed to me to be confident that this was going to play out eventually the right way. Was it frustrating to sort of have to let that play out while people kind of constantly attacked you during that? Well, it's always frustrating when the facts aren't part of the discussion, which is a whole lot of the time. And and the the most painful part to me is, you know, the, I, and I said a thousand times, but a lot of folks didn't want to take it in. The, the Justice Department said, hold back. By everything we all ever knew in our history up to that point, of course you would hold back if the Justice Department told you to. They had higher charges they were pursuing. They're the Justice Department, for God's sakes. We don't see it that way anymore because we learned from this bad experience and all of the shenanigans we're now seeing around the Justice Department over the last couple of years. But I, I feel like a lot of people kind of willfully ignored that reality. I don't think we could conceptualize what – I think people can't get it. I, I, I think that's it. the other part too. People's brains don't – function that way to understand the inner workings when you say that we were told by the federal government to chill they're going to do something so we're going to chill everybody's like chill what do you mean chill like they want they, they're emotional and they want it now and right. that's and, and that's why. and i get it but i would also say there's decades and decades and decades of history of the justice department playing a very important role in terms of civil rights that's in right. terms of police community issues so i get it i get the emotions obviously but it was frustrating that this giant fact was not sort of let into the discussion no matter how hard we tried to Make it clear. But I'll tell you what I always did believe, and I think this got underestimated too. The NYPD has changed so profoundly. It's hard again. I think a lot of people are stuck in time. I don't that's blame right. any one of the sort of that's their reference point. But this NYPD is so different. You know, I, I came up working for Mayor Dinkins. And so beginning of the 90s, uh, I spent a lot of time observing but also working with the NYPD and seeing the reality of that time. That's when we had 20,000, excuse me, 2,200, my apology, 2,200 murders a year. I mean, just in this, a very, very painful time. Mm. This NYPD today is so different in so many ways. And the fact that the U.S. Justice Department under two administrations refused to act, the local DA didn't bring charges, the only place there was a trial was an NYPD trial, and then it was so objective and so uh, actually about the facts that it came up with a guilty recommendation, and that was confirmed all the way up to the police commissioner. I think people, again, I get the emotions and everything else, but I hope people just stop and take stock now That's and right. say, wait a minute, wait a minute. The, not so long ago in this city or a lot of other cities, the last place you thought you'd find an objective trial of an officer was within the department itself. In this instance, the only place where there was an objective trial, the only place where there was a trial of any kind was within the NYPD. And I think people should really appreciate the change that's happened. Uh, unequivocally, you support impeachment of the president? Mm-hmm. Oh, long since. But it, you know, I, I feel like... If Donald Trump and Rudy Giuliani were trying to speed up the impeachment process, they could not do any better. Should Giuliani you know, go to jail? They're really, they're really outdoing themselves every day. Should Giuliani go to jail for his involvement in this Ukraine thing? I, I, I have felt for decades that Rudy Giuliani was a, a divisive human being who caused a lot of pain and a lot of harm. But if you're asking now about this as a matter of law, it sure looks that way. I mean, he deserves a trial like anyone else. But some people are like, oh, wow, Rudy suddenly went crazy. I'm like, no, wait a minute. Rudy, Rudy has been doing overtly divisive, racist things for decades. A long time. Yeah, and, and, and reckless. And so I don't think this is like sudden behavior. It just may be the most overtly criminal behavior. La- last thing, I know you got to go um... – you, in running for president, obviously I, I clowned about it earlier, but I thought you, we thought you did a really good job during Thank the debates. You. And frankly, for the climate of this country, politically, you seem like you would be a choice people could be interested in. Do you have any regrets of the timing? Could this have been better in four years when you could look back on your time as mayor and say, these are the things I did, and now I'm running for president, as opposed to right now where you took a lot of heat for traveling and working the whole process and campaigning while being mayor? Look, it's a great question, but I'll, I'll say it in two parts. So one, um, I had to ask myself the question before I decided to run, could we keep going 
everything we need to keep going here. And I think it's important that we're here on the day after this vote to get off Rikers Island, which probably could have not happened in most points in New York City history or most places in this country, but we managed to get it done, and it was being engineered all that time I was running for president. You know, all the other things that we've been able to do in recent months. I'm content that um, the agenda needed for this city kept moving. Uh, and I really felt that it was an important moment to step forward because we needed a progressive who could prove to people things like, yeah, I've kept crime down. We've got, you know, we've built up the economy here. We have more jobs. I mean, these were things I thought were really important to show, show. could happen in a progressive package, right? right? right. Uh, reducing crime while changing the relationship between police and community, for example. But the timing point to me is less about, you know, should I have waited for the future and all that, is more about I now understand how early these things happen. I mean, you know, I was laboring under the assumption that if you got into a race in the first half of the year before the election, that was still uh, effective. That's not the way the world is anymore. It's just everything's earlier, earlier, earlier. So I now realize that it was just too late to get in and be effective. But no, I, I, I kept saying, and I believe it, that, you know, we've now done in New York City a huge percentage of the things we wanted to do. You know, pre-K for all, we're trying to do 3K now. I'm very hopeful about that and what we've done to reduce crime, all these things, the affordable housing initiatives. We can't do the next big steps for New York City, the really, really big things, without the federal government being involved. And I can say that from uh, experience because the federal government for decades helped New York City build affordable housing helped us fund public housing, helped us build our subways. You know, everything that we think of, you think we did this all with our own money? No, we used to have a very, very intensive uh, federal partner. And part of why I ran was that if we don't get back to that, no matter how great New York City is, and we are great, we just don't have the money to do the things we will need to do in the future. To function. Right. And this is where it's sort of like, uh, sometimes I found, I respect the media, but I, I found they're sort of like, Oh, well, why not just fix everything with what you got? I'm like, that's just not real. That's not real. There has to be change at the federal level. And I want to be part of that discussion. I'll give you another example on uh, health care. A universal health care system will profoundly change the lives of people in this city. A truly universal system. We're now doing our version of it with our guaranteed health care through our public hospitals and clinics. And that's going to help a lot of people. But the answer, the true answer, is a universal health care system. And I think I give Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders credit in the debate the other night that they would not cave in to all this, um, I think, really unfortunate stereotyping of what they're trying to do. They are literally saying, like a lot of countries around the world, why don't we get enlightened enough to make sure that everyone has health care and no one can go bankrupt because, God forbid, they got cancer or some other disease. And we stop putting people over a barrel with insurance companies uh, and making it impossible for people to get the care they need. And this universal conversation is really about holding the insurance companies responsible as well as subsidizing, helping people who just can't afford to keep up. It, yeah, but I would say yes. But In its I, simplest terms. Yeah, but I want to take it one more step. People, a lot of folks who oppose change love to act like when you talk about health care, oh, we're only talking about people who don't have a lot of money. And that's what uh, hurt uh, – President Obama did something very good, very powerful with the Affordable Care Act. But his enemies and opponents love to paint it as, oh, this is for poor people and people of color. And that's how they, in many cases, undermined it. The fact is the vast majority of people who benefited from the Affordable Care Act are white. And a lot of them are not just low-income people. They're working people who are struggling to make ends meet. All those Americans out there with the two jobs or more desperately needed a more affordable kind of health care. But even with that, you've got a huge number of people uninsured, a huge number of people underinsured, not getting health care. Mm. I mean, the seniors who are the classic case, and it is based on fact, the senior who's not taking their insulin regularly enough because they can't afford it, and they're deciding between food and insulin. It's America. This shouldn't be the way it is. This is ridiculous. And so I want to just shout out both Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders for standing tall and saying, we're not, we're not playing this game. We're not caving in to these arguments from the moderates that somehow we should accept something less. I have not met a lot of people who will tell me how great their insurance plan is and how much they love the insurance companies. I think it's time we would be bolder in this country. I'm glad. I would, and I tried in my time on that stage to push this point hard, 
And I think the more progressives up there, the better. But I want to commend those two for continuing that fight really powerfully. Thank Mayor you, Bill de Blasio. So we still got you for a couple of years. Two years. You tried, you tried to quit the job and run for president. Stop we saw that. you. We saw you. That's cool. We still so we'll have you back again soon. You stuck with us, man. Thank you, you stuck Mayor. with us, man. I'm honored to be stuck <laughs> Thanks, with you.